Hello. Good afternoon. I decided to take uh, a few minutes to go over once again the uh, Great Barrington Declaration. Now, I have uh, seen it, but I'll admit I never read through it. Never. I'm familiar with it. Of course, I heard about it, as so many others have. But I refrained from uh, coming to any kind of conclusions about the Great Barrington Declaration. Interestingly, also I'll mention this, that before reading it in its entirety today, I have read the criticism of the Great Barrington Declaration. There were a few websites, and uh, when I typed in the Great Barrington Declaration, I came across uh, results which mentioned not only the website where this declaration is hosted, but also websites that offer criticism of it. And uh, one thing I observed is that it takes a, a certain uh, exaggerated acuteness of thinking to offer the kind of criticism that I came across. And uh, in the offering of that criticism, there is uh, an indulgence in theory, and uh, there is uh, a stepping away from what would be common sense. I understand science doesn't work through common sense. They can coincide, but uh, science is actually uncommon sense on many occasions. And why that is, is because there are a number of things, a number of things, a lot of examples that can be thought of in which uh, a person could be led to believe something, led to assume something, and that sounds good, yes. In our own, our, in our own minds, it sounds like, yes, this makes sense. And we should refrain from coming to the conclusion that this is how it would be on investigation. And a number of times it so happens that when you investigate something, and furthermore, if you get into the process of actually developing something, you find that uh, instinctive understanding or understanding through common sense, when it's subjected to analysis, leads to an arrival to a very different kind of conclusion. It happens many times. But, and this is an important point, there are also times when scientific analysis, especially when it is in the field of theory and academics, can lead to incorrect beliefs, incorrect conclusions. And those conclusions, when they are applied in the real world, are, as the saying goes, when the rubber meets the road. The best drawn out theories fall apart because um, in many applications, we're not uh, only building something. We're not building a wristwatch. We're not building uh, an audio system. We're not building a computer. 
with all its components. When such kinds of theories are brought into the real world where variables that are the most complicated variables in the universe that we know of, human behavior and different categories of humans divided by hierarchies and divided by behaviors and so many other factors when all of that is brought under the purview of a unifying theory there is every chance and it so does happen that practically what happens is not what the theory suggests should happen or would happen. So having given this introduction, let us read the great Barrington Declaration. So I took a look at the website. It is available in uh, several languages. You can read through any of the translations that are available. I'll leave a link for the website where the uh, declaration is hosted. And uh, I'll be reading it in English, of course. So let's start reading it. The Great Barrington Declaration. The Great Barrington Declaration, as infectious disease epidemiologists and public health scientists, we have grave concerns about the damaging physical and mental health impacts of the prevailing COVID-19 policies and recommend an approach we call focused protection. Coming from both the left and right and around the world, we have devoted our careers to protecting people Current lockdown policies are producing devastating effects on short and long-term public health. The results, to name a few, include lower childhood vaccination rates, worsening cardiovascular disease outcomes, fewer cancer screenings, and deteriorating mental health leading to greater excess mortality in years to come, with the working class and younger members of society carrying the heaviest burden. Keeping students out of school is a grave injustice. Keeping these measures in place until a vaccine is available will cause irreparable damage, with the underprivileged disproportionately harmed. Fortunately, our understanding of the virus is growing. We know that vulnerability to death from COVID-19 is more than a thousandfold higher in the old and infirm than the young. Indeed, for children, COVID-19 is less dangerous than many other harms, including influenza. As immunity builds in the population, the risk of infection to all, including the vulnerable, falls. We know that all populations will eventually reach herd immunity. That is, the point at which the rate of new infections is stable, and that this can be assisted by, but is not dependent upon, a vaccine. Our goal should there, therefore be to minimize mortality and social harm until we reach herd immunity. The most compassionate approach that balances the risks and benefits of reaching herd immunity is to allow those who are at minimal risk of death to, lie, to live their lives normally, to build up immunity to the virus through natural infection, while better protecting those who are at highest risk. We call this focused protection. I'll read this paragraph one more time. The most compassionate approach that balances the risks and benefits of reaching herd immunity 
is to allow those who are at minimal risk of death to live their lives normally to build up immunity to the virus through natural infection, while better protecting those who are at highest risk. We call this focused protection. Adopting measures to protect the vulnerable should be the central aim of public health responses to COVID-19. By way of example, nursing homes should use staff with acquired immunity and perform frequent testing of other staff and all visitors. Staff rotation should be minimized. Retired people living at home should have groceries and other essentials delivered to their home. When possible, they should meet family members outside rather than inside. A comprehensive and detailed list of measures, including approaches to multi-generational households, can be implemented and is well within the scope and capability of public health professionals. Those who are not vulnerable should immediately be allowed to resume life as normal. Simple hygiene measures such as hand washing and staying home when sick should be practiced by everyone to reduce the herd immunity threshold. Schools and universities should be open for in-person teaching. Extracurricular activities such as sports should be resumed. Young, low-risk adults should work normally rather than from home. Restaurants and other businesses should open. Arts, music, sport, and other cultural activities should resume. People who are more at risk may participate if they wish, while society as a whole enjoys the protection conferred upon the vulnerable by those who have built up herd immunity. On October 4, 2020, this declaration was authored and signed in Great Barrington, United States by and then it gives, gives the names of uh, all the individuals, the three individuals who are involved. And their names are as follows. Dr. Martin Kuldorf, professor of medicine at Harvard University, a biostatistician and epidemiologist with expertise in detecting and monitoring infectious disease outbreaks and vaccine safety evaluations. Dr. Sunetra Gupta, professor at Oxford University, an epidemiologist with expertise in immunology, vaccine development, and mathematical modeling of infectious diseases. And the last person mentioned is Dr. J. Bhattacharya, professor at Stanford University Medical School, a physician, epidemiologist, health economist, and public health policy expert focusing on infectious diseases and vulnerable populations. The names of the co-signers are mentioned here. And as I'm going through the list, it is an alphabetical list. So uh, I will be putting the link for the Great Barrington Declaration in the video description. I'm quite sure, as I have come across videos and websites where you can see criticism of the Declaration, you can see opinions about the Declaration, and uh, appreciation for the declaration, my purpose was to simply read the declaration to understand it and to give others the opportunity to do what I'm doing. You have to come to your own conclusion. As far as I'm concerned, I see a lot of good sense in what is mentioned here. what we call good common sense. 
and scientifically sound. My conclusion could be different from yours, depending on which side you're leaning on politically and um, your personal experience in life and those close to you. So that's why opinions differ. But uh, I would say this, that for this declaration to come out on October 4, 2020, and now we are in 2022, April, and I see that the authors of the declaration had a certain foresight as they could um, see, as I read earlier in the declaration, and I will highlight that portion one more time, keeping these measures in place until a vaccine is available will cause irreparable damage with the underprivileged disproportionately harmed. Now, the vaccine development, especially the mRNA vaccines, were developed in record time. And it's a tremendous scientific achievement. I'm not of the camp of the anti-vaxxers. I'm not. I've done plenty of research on mRNA technology platform and on the vaccines and I have uh, listened to doctors who are personally involved in uh, administering the vaccine and seeing the effects of the COVID-19 syndrome and uh, the protection that is afforded by the mRNA and other vaccines and uh, what I found in their um, understanding is that they were unbiased, at least the ones that I listened to. And they were open-minded about other treatment options as well. They were not focused solely on the vaccine. But they had a good understanding coming from their medical expertise, their background in science, and on the ground experience. Nevertheless, when the Great Barrington Declaration speaks of the uh, underprivileged being disproportionately harmed, you cannot deny that this economic impact has happened during the pandemic because of how matters were handled. And matters were handled differently in different places. Of course, let's not forget that. So we have to take our lessons when it comes to mandates. We have to take our lessons when it comes to having faith in institutions. And uh, we also have to admit that there are limitations to human understanding. And when decisions are made in such a way that it disregards <coughs> the, um, the differences, the real differences that exist in society, we have to admit that uh, we have unforeseen, undesirable effects 
which could not have been accounted for at the time when ideas were being developed. So I'd encourage you to read the declaration if you wish, read the uh, commentary about the declaration, but do not come to a decision in ignorance. Be informed and then you can decide. That is how it should be. So thank you very much for your time and uh, take care. Goodbye.